Paris, August 1997, the Alma Tunnel. A traffic accident, like those seen every day in Europe's capitals, left three people dead and one seriously injured. But this accident would have a global impact. In the back of the car, the most photographed woman in the world, Diana Spencer. You press that killed her. You're the scum. Yes. We're here to pick the bone. Public curiosity, thirst for sensationalism, this event caused an entire society to question the paparazzi's relentless hounding, the practices of the press, and its relationship with the British royal family. Tragic symbol of a robbed existence, Lady Di's death rocked a thousand-year-old monarchy. Carrière de gangster. Dix jours après la découverte du corps du petit gré provoqué ce nouveau, un véritable séisme en Belgique. In August 1997, the French papers were having trouble filling their pages. The summer is traditionally a period when there's a dearth of news. There's less international news, political news. And in the late 90s, it became the season for celebrity news. A time when reporters go to see what the celebs are up to on the beach. From the beginning of that summer, a photo story had unfolded daily in the general press and celebrity magazines. Diana, officially divorced since the summer of 1996, was no longer a member of the royal family. And that summer, for the first time, she carried on openly with a playboy, Dodi Al-Fayed. He was the son of the famous billionaire Mohammed Al-Fayed. After applying unsuccessfully for British citizenship, the Egyptian businessman bought himself the symbol of English luxury, Herod's department store. Dodi Al-Fayed's personality was obviously a major factor, too, in the obsessive media coverage. Diana had inherited part of the monarchy's image, and he part of this quintessentially British business. So they were a perfect couple. With all the ingredients of the perfect photo story, their fling quickly became worldwide news. A princess a notorious playboy, a jet-set lifestyle on a yacht cruising between Saint-Tropez and the Italian Riviera, but above all, a romance. It worked because the couple represented so much to so many. A thwarted romance, two divorcees rebuilding their lives, a love story, the very romantic trip to Paris. The paparazzi were always around. But soon, photos of Diana in her swimsuit were not enough, and the hunt was on for ever more intimate shots. This hunt culminated in Diana and Dodie's kiss, bought by the Sunday Mirror for a quarter of a million pounds, a whopping 500,000 euros in today's money. Readers couldn't get enough of the couple. The media frenzy had only just begun. Monsieur, bonjour. La princesse de Galles, Lady Di, est morte cette nuit à Paris dans un accident de voiture. Elle se trouvait avec son ami, le milliardaire de Diel Fayed. Leur voiture, une Mercedes noire, a été prise en chasse par des paparazzi. L'accident a eu lieu dans le tunnel du pont de l'Alma vers minuit. Tout le monde se souvient. Everybody remembers exactly where they were the day Diana died. The initial reaction was one of utter disbelief. No one could understand how she could be dead. She died in a horrific car crash. So there was this shock between this indestructible, almost picture-perfect beauty and the mangled car, the tragedy. The unexpected aspect, because she was young. Everyone thought her image would be around for years. 
As soon as the news was reported, a crowd gathered at the entrance to the Alma Tunnel. This event was not the ending to the photo story the public had expected. Rather, it had brought a spectacular end to Diana's incredible life. Princess Diana's death prompted an unprecedented outpouring of grief worldwide. People the world over were in shock. And the public were desperate for someone to blame. In the immediate days, the paparazzi were targeted. They were seen as responsible for the crash. La justice s'emploie actuellement à déterminer si les paparazzi ont une responsabilité quelconque dans l'accident mortel, voire une responsabilité morale. Less than 24 hours after Diana's death, her brother's statement to the press added fuel to the fire. It would appear that every proprietor and editor of every publication that has paid for intrusive and exploitative photographs of her, encouraging greedy and ruthless individuals to risk everything in pursuit of Diana's image, has blood on his hands today. The Republican press then jumped on that. They picked up on the idea that the royal family during her life and in their treatment of her after her death were actually a source of injustice. And I think it was quite remarkable that Earl Spencer was able to then reposition the media's role in general, but also the paparazzi in particular, as the perpetrators of her death. And so it really does become, in one sense, a battle for the narrative of the story of Diana, which is, is manifest in the press. With the investigation underway, it emerged the driver of the Mercedes had been drinking. It was initially presented as a tragedy caused by the media system. That is to say, the princess died because of the paparazzi. Then, in the days that followed, as a road safety tragedy. In other words, the crash happened because the driver was drunk. The driver's employers, the al Fayeds, were immediately accused of negligence. But at the same time, siding with the billionaire, the Egyptian press claimed it was a conspiracy. They argued the British could not accept that an Egyptian Muslim could eventually be the stepfather of the future king of England. The new story became fertile ground for conspiracists. Some saw the monarchy's hand in the crash, a consequence of Diana's disagreement with the queen. Others believed it was the work of the British Secret Service, who were wary of the wildly unpredictable princess. And yet others thought a mafia hitman had done the job, and it was linked to Mohammed Al-Fayed's murky affairs. At the same time, the police were actively looking for a mysterious white car reckoned to have caused the Mercedes to spin out of control. All the rumors and uncertainty reinforced the public's belief the truth was being hidden. Meanwhile, mourners left a sea of flowers outside Buckingham Palace, but the royal family remained utterly impervious to their pleas. The fact the royal family chose to remain at Balmoral instead of returning to London was seen as a sign of their hard-heartedness. And the danger was the monarchy's image would be so tarnished its very existence would be called into question. The British press fretted. Where is our queen? asked the son. Your people are suffering. Speak to us, ma'am, said the mirror. Show us you care, demanded the express. The whole affair was extremely awkward for the queen. Basically, she wasn't concerned about a woman who had divorced her son. She was tired of Diana's escapades. She'd had more than enough. So, I think initially, she really didn't want to do anything for the princess. In the days that followed, a Sunday Times poll revealed that 72% of Britons thought the Queen was out of touch with her people and 53% wanted Queen Elizabeth to abdicate. Tony Blair sensed the public's patience was wearing thin. He warned the Queen on several occasions. 
It was he who really understood how critical the situation was. He feared serious repercussions, a crisis threatening the monarchy's very future, and so he couldn't keep a stiff upper lip any longer. Keeping a stiff upper lip, a distinctively British form of decorum, a quality of uncomplaining stoicism at all times. And yet, for the first time in her reign, the Queen yielded to public pressure. The first thing she did was to come out of Balmoral to view the many floral tributes outside the gates. She finally realized something had to be done on the political level because her image was tarnished. Then, back in London, with a whiff of revolution in the air, the Queen had to resign herself to doing two things she loathed, speak on television and express her feelings. We have all felt those emotions in these last few days. So what I say to you now, as your queen and as a grandmother, I say from my heart. First, I want to pay tribute to Diana myself. She was an exceptional and gifted human being. It showed the strength, the durability of the British monarchy. Even though Diana was divorced from Prince Charles, her death meant she would forever be associated with the British monarchy. It even managed to rock this 1,000-year-old institution. The shock at the Alma Tunnel crash caused many to question the purpose of a non-governing monarchy. The British monarchy actually has a very important role because its purpose is to embody the nation, the English, the Welsh, who should never be forgotten, the Scottish, who can't stand being forgotten, and the Northern Irish. So these four nations need a reference point, and this reference point is given to them by the figure of the monarch, or of the queen at present. The monarchy represents continuity, a focal point, like a beacon towards which the British people can turn when things are changing. Since the end of the Second World War, the United Kingdom had been gripped by a feeling of decline caused by the loss of the empire and a downward economy. In 1979, Margaret Thatcher came to power. The Iron Lady's neoliberal policies initially caused serious problems. Unemployment soared to worrying levels, and riots broke out all over the country. In this morose climate, the Queen had to reassure the nation. But the monarchy had a problem, and that problem was Charles. The future king was over 30 and still not married the continuation of the dynasty was not ensured. The British monarchy was trying to stage a comeback. It needed to rejuvenate itself, and above all, it needed to place Prince Charles, who happened to be losing ground in this narrative. Charles was a womanizer. He had affairs with women who were already married, so he obviously couldn't marry them, but, as the Prince of Wales, he had to ensure the survival of the monarchy. From this perspective, at least, the monarchy was in crisis. He wasn't necessarily the brilliant, handsome young man the royal family might have hoped for. And so, Diana would make a perfect foil for Charles and for the monarchy, invented by this media system. And the invention of Diana Spencer as the ideal fiancé, the ideal wife for Prince Charles, brought a breath of fresh air to the monarchy and thrust it into the modern world. Diana almost fit that traditional fairy tale model of a princess, which is exactly those qualities of being young, beautiful, innocent, and often a virgin as well. Overnight, the naive 19-year-old was thrust into the media spotlight. The picture that caused a real sensation at the time was a photo taken in the garden of the Pimlico kindergarten where Diana worked as a teacher's aide. 
avec le soleil qui l'illuminait par derrière. With the sun et shining through her light cotton skirt, the shape of her legs was clearly visible. À travers le tissu très léger de la robe qu'elle portait, et donc cette photographie. This photo appeared on the front page of all the tabloids. And it was, in a sense, the first sign Diana would become a very photogenic person and the most photographed woman in the world. With Diana's image, there was what you could call a co-constructed phenomenon. To establish the narrative, the protagonist has to be willing, the public has to be receptive, and the media must be involved in the setup, in the character's creation, because this really was about creating a character. The young Diana was a virgin in every sense, in terms of her media image too. She had none. Here was a blank canvas on which the princesses image could be painted, and that's what the media worked on over the course of 15 years. The construction of this media narrative began with the wedding of the century. For the crown, it was the perfect opportunity to improve its image in the eyes of the world. I pronounce that they be man and wife together. People described the wedding as a fairy tale romance. So there you had the innocent, young, beautiful bride who had been swept off her feet by Prince Charming. And you even had the Archbishop of Canterbury who led the ceremony, saying that this is the stuff that fairy tales are made of. In the early 80s, Diana happily played the loving mother and wife, but by the end of the decade, she preferred to show herself as a woman who understood the suffering of others. Devoting time to charity work is part of a princess's traditional role. But Diana chose less conventional humanitarian causes, such as the anti-landmine campaign and AIDS. Her most publicized crusade was to dispel fears of contact with AIDS victims. She made a point of shaking hands with and talking to the patients. But what Diana did was unique, because at the time there was a lot of stigma still around disease and AIDS in particular, and a lot of fear around contagion. So the idea that you had a member of the royal family shaking hands with an AIDS patient was shocking. But on the other hand, it was also an incredibly saint-like gesture. Rather than focus on the princess as a true saint, the British press preferred to chronicle her rocky marriage. And at a time when the tabloids were struggling for circulation, Diana's run of bad luck was a godsend. To attract more readers, you need attention-grabbing headlines. So you highlight news that's related to politics, or rather political scandals, sex, celebrities, and the royal family, obviously, if there's some titillating or scandalous event. And so Diana became the darling of the tabloids and the new celebrity magazines. What was new was the importance of the image, how these pictures were gathered. And in fact, that's what changed between the early 80s and when Diana arrived on the media stage in the late 90s. The photos Paris Match paid huge sums for in the 60s and 70s were of expeditions to far-flung places, sporting feats. But with the new celebrity magazine market, editors were willing to spend massive amounts of money for exclusive photos of the stars. Diana turned out to be bankable on every score, whether it was her charity work, her latest outfit, and then at the same time, if the press talked about how the royal couple was spending most of their time apart and were basically leading separate lives, that created even more publicity. It boosted sales. Seeing someone who's in a sacred world, the world of the monarchy, experience mundane problems, triggers all sorts of fantasies. We can identify with a person and maybe even derive some pleasure from the fact that they have the same problems we do. But Diana was not just the media's plaything. She was behind some stories, too. She saw them as a means to her end, to take advantage of her popularity, to better negotiate her separation from Prince Charles. 
I think it was soap opera in the sense that it was unprecedented the extent to which, as a royal couple, Charles and Diana had let the public in, in terms of their private lives. And in doing so, in having not only a public separation, but a public divorce that played out in the media, it became almost dramatic. In 1995, during a TV interview, Diana disclosed extremely intimate details about her private life. Until then, the British monarchy's rule had been never complain, never explain. And here you had a kind of outpouring in broad daylight of the most intimate aspects of their lives. Once she started disclosing information and actually highlighting that the rumors were true, that's when she facilitated this appetite for scandal. There's this hunger in the press for more stories, more controversies, more scandals. This was the start of an unstoppable spiral whose tragic outcome would be the Alma Tunnel crash. Given the global shock, the decision was made to broadcast Princess Diana's funeral live around the world. Despite the time difference, 2.5 billion viewers watched the event. The funeral on September 6, 1997 was a truly unique event. Not only because of the global impact it had, but also the way the ceremony itself was organized. You had tradition and openness, modernity. That day, the royal family was joined by political figures, such as Queen Noor of Jordan and Hillary Clinton, as well as big showbiz names like Tom Cruise, George Michael, and Elton John. Diana was the very epitome of Col Britannia, which began in the spring of 1997 when Tony Blair became prime minister. A true jet setter, Diana had not been a member of the royal family since her divorce. And so the monarchy had to urgently devise a ceremony that would be a fitting tribute to the woman the entire world saw as the Princess of Hearts, but not breach royal protocol. It wasn't a state funeral, but like all previous sovereigns, her coffin was mounted on a gun carriage and draped with a royal standard. Her funeral represented, in a sense, Diana's return to the royal fold. After a chaotic week during which the world's press criticized the archaism of the British monarchy, Queen Elizabeth understood a strong symbolic gesture was required. As the funeral cortege passed Buckingham Palace, the Queen bowed her head before Diana's coffin. It was absolutely unthinkable, and it must have been extremely hard for her to do, because it went against everything in the royal rule book. The sovereign does not bow to anyone. This historic gesture caused the French newspaper Le Monde to write, Great Britain buries Diana and a certain idea of the monarchy. The Alma Tunnel crash did in fact hasten reforms to open up and modernize the monarchy. Very soon after Diana died, uh, significant institutional changes took place in the monarchy, and that included giving female equal succession rights to men, and also lifting the ban that was previously established, which forbade uh, the monarch from marrying a Roman Catholic. So those two changes took place. Without a doubt, Diana's death redefined the relationship between the press and the monarchy. In the United Kingdom, rules have been established since, in particular on media coverage of the royals. A code of conduct was adopted by the British press to respect the privacy of the royal family. On the one hand, there's still a, a high level of formality in terms of not letting them into their private life and, and very much controlling the relationship with the press, managing it. But on the other hand, you can see a much more casual relationship. So while there's definitely discretion, there's also much more warmth than there had been prior to Diana.
They have become far, far more in control of their media coverage. William and Kate choose the photographers they wanted to work with and invited them inside their home. The idea is to eliminate a photo's rarity value. What's rare is expensive. This is like saying, this photo isn't rare, so don't chase after it. We're giving it to you. Ironically, the future King of England's less confrontational relationship with the press is a direct consequence of the death of his mother, Lady Diana, the woman who played a little too much with the media.